The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to today's webinar on the Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification. My name is Richard Hayden from Uninet and I'll be the moderator today. The presentation is going to be done by Tom Tolleton, who is an expert in the field with uh, Dixon Hughes Goodman. And uh, we're very excited to share this webinar. You know, the US uh, DOD's new cybersecurity model is probably the hottest topic in government contracting right now in terms of what will the impact be, when will the impact be. And so with that said, uh, over to you, Tom. Yeah, thank you, Richard. I appreciate it. Uh, Richard and I were quasi joking shortly before the broadcast that, you know, CMMC and coronavirus right now are kind of fighting for the most critical topic in the uh, DOD supply chain for sure. But um, I appreciate the opportunity uh, to be invited to, to speak on, on CMMC specifically. Um, again, my name is Tom Tollerton. Um, I'm a managing director in uh, DHG's IT Advisory Services Group. Um, DHG, if you're unfamiliar, is a, a top 20 public accounting and advisory firm headquartered in Charlotte, which is where I am. Um, I've got over 15 years of experience in, in cybersecurity and data privacy matters, um, and it seems like every industry, frankly, is kind of popping up their own framework or, or risk management requirement. Um, and obviously DOD is, is no different here with CMMC. Um, it's an interesting um, initiative. Uh, I look forward to kind of walking through uh, the, the high with, from a high level the framework with you. Um, but I also want to kind of keep some of the comments um, critical and just get people thinking about what the next steps are, what obligations are going to be, um, and so forth. But uh, my background is in cyber risk. Um, in all industries and uh, helped a lot of contractors out with the NIST 800-171 framework and the DFARS rule that has existed previously. So I have some experience with the controls we're going to talk about today. Um, but first, I, I really kind of want to start with a disclaimer that, that DOD has been very explicit with as well, uh, and that is that you know CM, CMMC, the Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification framework has been released, but there are no assessors, there is no certification requirement as of yet. Um, there is still additional guidance that is to be issued about um, the framework. And DOD has kind of seen some third party providers noting that um, they can offer certification um, guidance at this point. And frankly, that's a little bit disingenuous at this point. I mean, there are the controls are released. You can help interpret the controls as they exist, but from a certification standpoint, we don't know what that looks like just yet. So for those that may be kind of new to the idea of CMMC um, and are still looking to see what the requirements are, just be aware that there is no certification expectation at this point, but it is um, to be coming shortly. We expect, frankly, the assessment guidance just within the next couple of weeks that will be openly available, similar to the framework that's available right now. Um, open to the public, and that guidance will allow organizations to to help um, understand how they will be assessed when the certification program um, ultimately is released. But I just kind of wanted to open with that, um, that there is still a lot of detail and guidance to follow. But um, let's kind of continue about what the call to action has been and why the CMMC framework really is, is on this fast track. I'm sure the uh, attendees on this webinar are aware that there is a very aggressive timeline, um, but I just kind of want to talk about what we're seeing right now. And, and frankly, there are numerous studies um, available from from a lot of think tanks talking about uh, the billions of dollars that cyber attacks have cost federal, state, um, and local governments. Um, and the CMMC framework itself, even if you read it, cites the, the Council of Economic Advisors uh, report that estimates in, in 2016 uh, cyber activity and, and breaches cost the federal government somewhere between 57 and 109 billion dollars. Um, and I even actually saw a tweet uh, just this morning uh, from the Center of Strategic and International Studies, a big defense think tank, noting that Vladimir Putin could hire 8,000 attackers for the price of one fighter jet. Um, and that sort of puts the, the cost benefit of, of cyber risk management into, into context. Um, adversaries could spend just a fraction um, of that amount for a successful cyber breach. 
either steal data or introduce chaos like um, ransomware um, on our infrastructure, damaging um, attacks on our infrastructure. We're seeing that play out right now um, kind of in a smaller way with state and local governments that are getting hit by ransomware attacks. Um, last, year in Bal uh, last year, Baltimore was attacked. Um, 13 or 14 counties in the state of Texas were attacked with ransomware and effectively, effectively shut down um, major infrastructure in those, in those counties and, and municipalities. But the prime example um, you know, that, that a lot of folks refer to is what you see on the screen here, um, and that's the breach of, of a contractor that was responsible for maintaining um, unclassified but still sensitive uh, data related to the design of the F-35 jet back in um, 2016 and 2017. Um, and interestingly, kind of in this picture, you see the, the similarities in the form factor between the F-35 and China's um, recent J-31 fighter jet. And while the underlying technology between those two um, aircraft is, is likely very different and you know, they may have different capabilities as a result, um, physical schematics were part of that data breach um, with the contractor and was considered um, CUI. And so there, the design of, of that aircraft obviously was, was impacted as a result of the data breach. But interestingly as well, um, the in the response to that data breach, it was determined that the underlying vulnerability of the systems of that contractor was really simple, um, just simple vulnerability management. It was poor administration of IT systems. Um, and it kind of suggests that it probably wasn't really hard to compromise that contractor's network and system. Um, and probably could have been avoided with some, some basic cyber hygiene and some basic cybersecurity protocols. So just I kind of want to give an example of what, um, you know, what is driving this, the DOD and the CMMC initiative at this point. So Richard, we got a polling question here. Yeah, let me launch the first poll here. The question is, does your organization currently have or plan to have contracts with the DOD? Um, this is very much a DOD initiative, but I think a lot of the civilian agencies are watching closely and we may well see them following suit. So uh, please answer. We'll uh, give you yeah. a few more seconds and then uh, we'll uh, close the poll and then share the results. Okay, we're probably in a good place now. So here are the results. And we get yes at 70%. No at 11% and not sure at 19%. All right. Yeah, and it's a, it's a great point that you made there, Richard, a second ago that um, other agencies, civilian agencies, are kind of watching the, the CMMC initiative with DOD to see how, how it plays out. Um, you know, Katie Arrington, the CISO for the Undersecretary of Defense uh, for Acquisition, has joked that they're waiting to see if it falls flat on its face. Um, if it doesn't, it's a really fantastic model for other agencies to adopt um, because it is, you know, a very standard framework and it's also a kind of a risk-based and maturity level framework um, that does incorporate um, a certification. So it's, that, that's something to keep in mind for any entities and any uh, companies represented on the call today that, that aren't necessarily doing work with, with DOD or a contract to DOD. So let's, let's take one step back from CMMC and talk about what has been in place um, around data security and DOD supply chain. So the, the DFARS rule um, for acquisition uh, referenced above 252.204.7012 um, stipulated a few um, requirements for cybersecurity protocol uh, before CMMC even got started. And so the four major components listed here, kind of what that DFARS rule pointed to, and that, to start, you had to have a system security plan, um, the purpose of which was really to establish a program for operating a secure uh, system uh, with consistent and, and standardized security practices. Um, that document was uh, designed to define the scope um, and boundaries of an environment um, that was supporting a contract and, and really outline the policies, procedures, and practices uh, for protecting data. 
and then that system security plan needed to incorporate the security control requirements in a publication called the NIST Special Publication 800-171. And we won't get into that, but it is effectively a, a set of security controls uh, based upon 14 security domains or objectives or areas. And, and we'll take a look at what domains look like when we talk about CMMC here in a second. Um, the DFARS rule also incorporated a mandatory cyber incident reporting re uh, rule. Um, whereby all confirmed security incidents needed to be reported to the DOD contracting officer within 72 hours. That was a really stringent requirement for, for smaller contractors to adhere to. Um, and then finally, there was a flow down requirement um, and it mandated that, that all contractors have to flow down each of the above security requirements to its subsidiaries, uh, excuse me, to its uh, subcontractors. And we've really seen a lot of challenge with, with that. Um, you know, as we kind of noted earlier, this was um, kind of a big framework for a lot of small contractors. And if a small contractor wasn't taking its obligations for cybersecurity seriously, then it was pretty likely that it wasn't taking its subcontractors' cybersecurity implementation um, seriously either. And the DFARS rule, as it was written and described here, was a self-assessment. It was a self certification, if you will, um, and contractors were able to basically evaluate themselves. And uh, that has turned out, uh, frankly, to be an ineffective model, unfortunately. Contractors either didn't have uh, the resources to manage an effective cybersecurity program or they didn't place the emphasis on it that uh, DOD expected when they built this, this DFARS rule. And frankly, DOD wasn't enforcing it consistently um, either. And so as a result, um, DOD was funded for a, a more sophisticated um, supply chain security program, and that's kind of where we are with, with CMMC. But um, another concept to, to note um, is with the MITRE uh, Institute Deliver Uncompromised report that was released a year or so ago, and that really kind of kick-started um, the initiative for CMMC. And of course, the three traditional pillars for, for contract acquisition with DOD have been cost, you know, what's, what's, the, what's the project going to cost, what's the schedule for delivery, and then finally the performance um, of, the, of the contract. And, and the MITRE report suggested that security should be a fourth pillar alongside all of those um, previously existing pillars, um, which was great conceptually, but it also suggests that there might be some trade-offs between cost and schedule versus security or security and performance versus cost and so forth, as we see kind of with the, the traditional model. So the uh, CISO for the Undersecretary of Defense for Acquisition, Katie Arrington, who I referenced a second ago, um, actually has come in and she's changed that a little bit. And we don't have a graphic for it here on the screen, but her objective was to move security to the foundation under which the three traditional pillars would operate. So security would be a prerequisite before you even could consider um, cost schedule of or performance of a um, of a contractor. So it's it's a bit of a mindset mentality, but it's important to understand conceptually that that cybersecurity and data protection are built now into the very uh, expectations of, of a contractor in all contracts. So I mentioned this special publication 800-171. Um, just kind of in summary real quick, this is a framework of security controls, as I mentioned, um, for CUI data, or what's called controlled unclassified information. And there are a lot of different types of information that fall under that category, and, and the National um, Archive Registry is responsible for maintaining that list, but when we talk about schematics or um, documentation related to a system, um, support files, any sort of information that supports a contract but is not classified in and of itself is typically considered to fall under the realm of, of CUI. Um, and so the NIST Special Publication 800-171 was a set of controls designed to help contractors who have that type of data um, on their systems uh, secure that data effectively. So Richard, I think we've got our, our next polling question. Yep, 
Um, it's really asking if your organization has developed a system security plan around the NIST 800-171 requirements. Yeah, and I, and I would just state that that is an expectation of all contractors with COD and subcontractors at this point. So even with CMMC not being um, in force necessarily just yet, uh, system security plan is still expected based upon the DFARS rule. Okay, we're up to about two thirds of people voting. So let's um, let's close the results here and share them. And we see um, the top answer is yes, 45% have a system security plan, 38% are not sure, and 70% say no. All right, back to you, Tom. Right. So, something to consider for contractors um, moving forward that a system security plan is going to be a baseline um, that will need to be implemented. But um, well, let's talk about now the, the CMMC initiative itself, and we'll kind of take a high-level look at what the framework is, how it's designed and built, um, and then break down kind of the, the processes and controls to a certain degree. We'll, we'll kind of get into that just a little bit, but um, just a quick overview for those that may not be familiar at all with um, CMMC. So it is the Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification Framework. Um, it is a maturity model um, based upon the capability maturity model integration um, framework that was built by Carnegie Mellon, I think, back in the 1980s. Um, it is, interestingly, in addition to being a maturity model, it is also a certification, and specifically a third-party certification, which is kind of unusual in the world of, of cybersecurity um, compliance, if you will. We see a lot of um, checkbox requirements. We see a lot of um, all or nothing type certifications, but integrating different maturity levels alongside of the certification is, is somewhat rare. So it, it's somewhat of a unique initiative. I, I mentioned earlier, this is kind of a unique initiative and there are a lot of agencies that are keeping an eye on it. And that, that truly is the case because they want to see if on a large scale, like the government contracting industry, if um, if this, this model works. So there are five levels, level one being the lowest level of maturity required, all the way up to level five, which is the most uh, mature and most stringent, if you will, set of controls. Um, the certification element will require a third party assessor and they've named those uh, C3 PAOs. And if you're familiar with FedRAMP, uh, which is another federal certification framework, it's, it's sort of mirrors that or similar to that, um, that's short for CMMC Third Party Assessment Organizations, um, C3PAOs. So these will be organizations that are accredited by um, DOD through a CMMC accreditation body, um, and they will be required to perform a third party certification assessment. Um, I mentioned the accreditation body, the CMMC AB, that is the body that DOD has um, instructed to prepare this framework, to train assessors, and to manage the certification process. It's called the CMMC AB. Um, the model is expected to be similar to FedRAMP in that contractors will need to be certified, but they will be certified by the CMMC AB. The assessor will not be responsible for issuing the certification. The AB will be responsible um, for issuing that certification. And then third, uh, something that's of interest to contractors um, that I talk to is, is the idea that this is going to be an allowable cost, that we, that we can roll the cost of the assessment, cost of infrastructure required to be compliant into the overall cost of a contract. Um, there is a lot of ambiguity around that right now. It's not completely clear how that's going to work, but um, from what I've heard that is that DOD and, and the CMMC AB are, are working with um, you know, federal economists and Treasury Department to see how that that's how that's going to work because that will cost um, government likely a lot of additional money uh, to support. So now I just want to give kind of a high-level timeline of um, 
CMMC and, and where we're at with the deployment. I mentioned it's not complete, and that is is true. There's still a lot to come, but um, just back in January, the CMMC AD uh, accreditation body received their charter from DOD to develop and put this framework into place. So we are still very, very new uh, with that body. Um, at the end of that month, they released the framework, which has been under uh, development with DOD and with Carnegie Mellon and a few other uh, interested parties. Um, so they finally prepared that and the AB issued that framework. And over there on the right is actually a, a picture of it, um, of the cover page um, at least. Um, and just this past Friday, we continue to kind of get information trickling out about CMMC and CUI protections and so forth. Um, uh, an instruction around CUI handling was released by DOD. Um, it was geared toward DOD projects and DOD contracting officers on how to handle CUI information. It was an updated instruction there. It didn't necessarily apply greatly to contractors, but it sort of set the table for what is to come for contractors um, that have to handle CUI. Um, and then moving forward, uh, this timeline has, has stayed relatively static. It's, it's an aggressive timeline, but by June or July, the end of Q2 and into Q3 of this year, it's expected that we'll start to see the certification requirements for CMMC incorporated into the RFIs. Um, issued by DOD, and then later in September, we'll see those RFIs get turned into RFPs, um, which will have the certification requirement in them as well. Um, and it's important to note here that um, the CMMC requirement or certification will be a requirement upon the time of award of a contract. So if a contractor wants to bid on an RFP or on a contract, they're able to do that, but they will not be awarded the contract until um, until it's, it's time to award. So it's, it's important to make sure that we're, we're going to talk about this in a little bit. It's important to uh, get ready for certification requirements that may be coming in, in contracts. And then also in September of, of 2020, um, we're going to see the DFARS rule officially updated, the one I referenced earlier to incorporate the CMMC level requirements for, for various contracts. Ultimately, we expect the, the CMMC program to be fully deployed by fiscal year 2026, um, so roughly five years from now. All contractors um, in the defense industrial base that are serving a federal contract, excuse me, a DOD contract, will have um, some level of, of CMMC certification to their, to their name. So now I want to jump a little bit deeper into kind of breakdown of, of what the framework is. What, what are we actually being expected to do as contractors um, when it comes to data security? And so I mentioned 14 domains that were included in the NIST 800-171 framework, which is the current standard. CMMC incorporates those 14, the same 14, plus an additional three. So if we take a look at all of these domains, we kind of see security goals or security objectives around the protection of data, just starting up there at the top left, access control, you know, limiting who has access to, uh, to systems and to information. And the three additional uh, domains that have been introduced are really also incorporate some level of integrity and availability. So the designers um, at Carnegie Mellon uh, recently presented on kind of what they were thinking when they moved into the CMMC framework from NIST 800 They wanted to incorporate those additional principles beyond just confidentiality of data. They wanted to introduce integrity and availability as well and more maturity around um, data protection. And so asset management was an introduction into this framework. They're encouraging uh, contractors to understand what systems that they have, a complete picture of the systems that they have, where they are, how they handle them from the complete life, the complete life cycle of um, IT and data assets. And then recovery. Um, I mentioned ransomware previously. Ransomware is a, a very nasty uh, uh, sort of malware that impairs an organization's ability to access their own data. It doesn't necessarily involve a, a theft of data, but it does 
involve the availability and access to data. And so they want organizations to be ready to deal with something like that and to be able to quickly recover um, in the event of an attack like that. And then situational awareness, um, that third additional domain, really speaks to the ability to um, share information um, with other parties and understand kind of what the threat environment looks like through relationships, through information sharing, um, they call it indicators of compromise, being able to access that information, incorporate it quickly into your own environment, but also share your information uh, confidential, uh, confidentially as, as much as possible with other um, organizations that could be impacted as well. So those were the 17 domain areas. Um, this graphic is frankly pulled directly from the framework itself, the framework document. And it introduces us to the idea of process and practice, process being a CMMI uh, you know, maturity concept. So I would start really on the right side of this graphic talking about the different practices. There are different practices from each of the domains that we just looked at at each level of maturity. So if we start at the bottom, we're looking at level one and moving up, of course, to two, three, four, and five. Um, when we start at level one, under the practices, we talk about basic cyber hygiene. So this is the, what we call basic blocking and tackling in the cyber world. Are we, do we have a firewall in place? Do we have a security policy? Um, do we have anti-malware and so Just very basic, do we haves and are we doings, uh, so to speak. And then as we move up the practice ladder to each um, uh, incremented maturity level, we look to more sophisticated practices. So intermediate cyber hygiene, good cyber hygiene, um, proactive, and then finally advanced and, and progressive. Those practices then map into process. And process is really how we implement those practices. So if we go back to level one, uh, the performed process, it, goes, it, it speaks to simply, are we doing this? You know, is this something that we can say we are honestly implementing? Are we implementing basic cyber hygiene? And then as we move to level two, have we documented it? Do we have documented policy and procedure to routinely and consistently implement uh, the practices that we need to for our maturity level? Level three, is it managed? Are we continuing to maintain that documentation, maintain those processes? Um, fourth is, is reviewed. Level four, CMMC level four is, are we reviewing? Do we have metrics and measurements for prioritizing um, the practices that we have and improvements to those practices. And then finally, level five, optimizing. Are we, are we as sophisticated as, as we can be um, relative to the practices that we have? And so this is kind of a, a summary of the number of practices and processes that fall within each of the um, maturity levels that we're talking about here. So I'll, I'll give kind of a quick summary of uh, the levels. Level one is, as I mentioned, the most basic um, expectation for data security. So this is likely an organization that does not handle confidential information, controlled and classified information. Uh, they don't have those schematics that, you know, associated with the F-35. They're doing services or produce products for the government that don't have that sort of information. Uh, level two is, has been considered really a step up to level three. So um, Katie Errington has explicitly said that there probably will not be a high number of level two uh, requirements in contracts. You'll either see level one or level three. And level three is pretty much a direct mapping to the existing standard for NIST 800-171 for protecting classified, uh, controlled and classified information. So as organizations sort of take that maturity step, if they start to handle more sensitive information, we'll start to see them move from level one um, to level three, usually skipping level two from a certification requirement. And then level four and five, uh, the intention is really to and I'll jump to the next slide to kind of show the, the transitions um, between maturity levels. But 
levels four and five are really designed for DOD programs and, and sophisticated projects within DOD uh, that may in some capacity support really classified uh, information. And so it's, here in this graphic, it shows um, a focus on reducing the risk of what we call advanced persistent threats, APTs, um, nation state attackers that are very targeted and explicit with um, the entities that they're trying to compromise. Levels four and five will be a little bit fewer and far between than, than probably levels one and three. But um, I think I'm going to talk about it in a little bit that level three is probably what most organizations are going to want to aim for, if not for the certification, at least in practice. Um, it's a pretty, as it's described, good cyber hygiene. It's um, kind of what we should expect and what we would expect in the commercial space as well. Um, so this is kind of just a, a reiteration, a breakdown. I think I mentioned this. Levels one, two, and three are, are right now kind of the, the base expectations. Level three uh, mirrors NIST 800-171. And then levels four and five uh, place that focus on more sophisticated operations, continuous monitoring for advanced persistent threats and are designed really for, for special programs and projects um, within DOD. So Richard, all that said, we've got another, another poll question. Yeah, so the question is based on either your own analysis or uh, Tom's uh, discussion, what CMMC level would you estimate your organization to be? Of course, no one is certified, but just in terms of your own practices and uh, the controls he talked about, where would you see yourself? And the votes are coming in. Give it a, another 20 seconds or so. All right, let's close and share the results. So the top result is level three, good cyber hygiene. Uh, level two, intermediate. Level one, basic. We have a few at no level or not sure, and zero at level four or five at the moment. No, that sounds about right. Um, we'll talk about the majority of, of the contracts are likely to be levels one, two, or three. But um, so we're about a little more than halfway through our time here. That's kind of the, the high level overview of, of where we're at with CMMC. Um, I want to get now into a little bit more of a kind of analytical conversation or I guess monologue about um, about where we're at with CMMC. So DOD has said from the very beginning that this will be a requirement of all contractors throughout their supply chain. Um, you know, whether it's uh, janitorial services or you know, landscape maintenance, um, all the way up to you know the primes that are supporting really sophisticated um, DOD programs, um, they will all be required to have a certification. Uh, the timeline has been very aggressive. Um, but there has been some clarification just recently in the past couple of weeks on kind of what that timeline is, is realistically going to look like. Um, DOD has recently said that 15 contracts are likely to have the CMMC uh, requirement incorporated in fiscal year 2021, um, followed by um, 75, I think it was, in, in 2022. And then by 2025, upwards of, of 500 or so, maybe a little less, we'll have the CMMC requirements actually built in. Um, so as a result, with those 15 contracts, they believe that 1,500 contractors will be certified levels one to five, followed next year in 2021 by um, 7,500 contractors. So as you can see, they kind of are staggering um, the implementation of, of this framework. Um, there hasn't been any insight um, that I'm aware of, of which contracts um, will have those uh, CMMC requirements built into them just yet, but it's kind of just best to assume that if you're chasing after a contract or intend to chase after a DOD contract that um, you expect that that would be coming soon. Um, there's some concern as well around barrier uh, to entry. Um, some of the contractors that I've spoken with, um, small and medium-sized ones, are a little concerned that they won't have the resources um, to achieve uh, certification and bid on contracts. 
DOD has been very explicit in trying to sort of quell those concerns that they're making this very accessible, that certification should not be expensive, um, that infrastructure implementation, because there are maturity levels, should not be um, that expensive. But, you know, we'll, we'll see how that plays out. Um, really, as a result, a lot of contractors are concerned that um, DOD could end up giving contracts previously awarded to, to smaller contractors, to larger contractors who've already uh, achieved those mature, uh, higher levels of maturity, if you will. Um, it's a big concern. Um, it's important, I think, that DOD try and balance this security initiative with initiatives to support small business. And I think they will. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm not an attorney, but I could definitely see some contract disputes being raised um, kind of over this. So hopefully we, we can get that right here as an industry. Um, another concern is in that third bullet is the overclassification of data, the potential overclassification of data, awarding contracts basically just to, again, to more sophisticated contractors. Um, CMMC is technically an, an effort, I believe, to, to fight this. Um, they're trying to raise the bar really for everyone, but it's still a concern that could, that could definitely raise some, some legal disputes. Um, the flow down from, from primes through the supply chain, that is expected. So since all contractors within the, within the supply chain will be required to have a certification, um, all primes and subs down the line will have to have a certification. But, it's, has, but it hasn't been clear as to whether or not all contractors to a level three prime contractor have to have that um, level three certification as well. It's sort of coming into clarity that, that no, that's probably not the case. So fourth and fifth party contractors to a contract probably don't necessarily need to have the higher levels of, of uh, certification. But again, guidance is forthcoming that, that hopefully should, should clarify that um, once and for all. Um, and then the cost allocation, I, I mentioned this is supposed to be baked into a contract or can be baked into a contract, um, but there is a, a lack of, of clarification on that right now. Um, another consideration that, that isn't on this slide that I think is worth mentioning um, is sort of how these requirements could evolve over time. So Katie Arrington continues to reiterate that CMMC will not be a check-the-box exercise. This is not just a one-and-done um, sort of effort. Um, but since the threat environment that DOD and, and we all face continues to change, uh, we should expect the, the framework to continue to change and how we certify to continue to change. So uh, DOD has stated they anticipate that the requirements for each of the levels will probably change year over year um, due to threats that are, are changing. And so contractors will need to um, maintain an effective security compliance program that really stays attuned um, to the overall and larger landscape, um, as well as DOD directives, which will continue to come out. So one comment that, that I, uh, or one question I guess I should say, I, I get a, an awful lot, um, is around what are called plans of action and milestones, or POAMs. Um, this question comes up a lot when, when people are, are curious about you know, needing to meet every single one of the security obligations in CMMC. So plans of action and milestones, POAMs, um, are written plans specifically created when a contractor can't meet a particular control requirement, um, in this case, NIST 800-171, um, or in the rest of that DFARS clause for protecting CUI data. Um, the POAM is designed to document the reason for the control gap and then a plan for remediation over a, a period of time, effectively. It's, that's really what it's designed to do. And so a contractor might create a POAM if their infrastructure or, or their operations currently don't meet one of the requirements. Um, and they, they want to have an acceptable way to meet the, the compliance obligations. And to this point, POAMs have been an acceptable way to meet compliance. If a contractor uh, was working toward remediating, remediating control gaps, um, a POAM was considered acceptable for, for compliance purposes in, in many cases. Um, the problem with that is, or has been, that there has been an over-reliance upon POAMs to meet even basic um, security control objectives. Contractors would perform their assessment or 
you know, work with a third party advisor um, to, to perform their NIST 8171 compliance assessment. Um, so they, they'd go through that process, but they didn't meet a control, so they would create a POEM for it, and then it got kind of pushed to the back burner, and ultimately the control was never met. So DOD has decided that that is not going to be acceptable um, in the CMMC framework moving forward. Um, it has not worked. And so at this point, security, or excuse me, certification at a specific maturity level is going to be kind of all or nothing, go, no, go. So there won't be an opportunity to, uh, to implement a, a plan of action or milestone. And this is really why we're recommending that uh, contractors get started with understanding cybersecurity posture against uh, ideally level three, CMMC level three, um, to do an assessment or partner with somebody to, to help you with an assessment and, and recommendations for, uh, for remediating issues because you know, it, it will be a requirement, and POAMs, if, if you haven't met all the requirements, you will likely not uh, be awarded a contract. So some considerations. Now, we talked about some challenges, some questions. Um, I just want to kind of throw out some ideas and some things to think about. Um, while we expect um, there to be some clarifications soon around scoping. There really hasn't been final guidance um, just yet around whether an entire organization or a certain environment or just a system have to be certified uh, to a CMMC maturity level. Um, it's possible that, that one or all of those could be required, but um, we kind of expect that to come down in the next month or so, uh, what truly is, where the certification is applied so to speak. I mean, ideally, a, sort of, uh, a contractor could reduce the scope of their certification assessment by placing uh, some physical or some logical boundaries around the people, systems, and, and processes that handle CUI data. Um, that, that would be the, you know, the ideal scenario to help minimize scope and effort and cost and so forth. And it's an approach that's taken by a lot of different frameworks like PCI for credit card data security and, and um, HIPAA and high trust for healthcare and so forth. Uh, we'll see if that's going to be something acceptable for CMMC in the future. But um, another consideration is the offload of compliance, um, leveraging third party providers. Um, this is an idea that absolutely makes sense. I mean, you want to look for third party providers that are already certified. You want to leverage um, their infrastructure and their certification um, where it makes sense. Um, I always think of the uh, management consultant, Peter Drucker, who you know, always used to say, do what you do best and outsource the rest. Um, that certainly applies here. What I do caution contractors on is really over-reliance upon third-party and managed service providers for their complete compliance with CMMC. Um, it's really easy for smaller companies that lack sophisticated IT departments um, to fall victim to, to this mentality that they have a third party that offers a product or service and that product or service will make their entire end, um, organization certified or compliant. Um, when in reality, it usually is just kind of one piece um, of the puzzle, overall compliance puzzle, if you will. So uh, for example, kind of to that, to that end, we talked about, um, or at least we saw incident response as one of the 17 domains in CMMC, the ability to respond to an incident. And, you know, we, we can see contractors hiring attorneys, data monitoring services, forensic investigators, all those are key to an incident response program, but it is the contractor itself ultimately responsible for the incident response plan um, and for the process that is followed um, in the event of an incident. And so having that oversight is a responsibility of the contractor itself, and it cannot offload that responsibility completely. You can offload operation and implementation of controls, um, but you, you don't necessarily offload the risk of the failure of your organization to meet um, compliance obligations, to kind of put it a slightly different way. Um, FedRAMP reciprocity. Um, FedRAMP, as I mentioned, as we got started, is, is another framework around uh, information security, system security. Uh, it's focused on cloud service providers to the federal government 
and DOD has stated that there will be some sort of credit that will be given to FedRAMP certified entities for CMMC certification. So we don't completely know, it's another concept that we don't have full clarity on just yet, but um, if you're already FedRAMP certified, you can kind of take some level of comfort um, in that fact. Um, understanding reliance upon you know, subcontractors, um, as I mentioned previously, the DFARS rule will be revised in the coming months to incorporate CMMC and it will continue to stipulate a slowdown of security compliance through the supply chain. Um, it isn't the expectation, as I said previously, that um, if a contractor needs level three certification that all subcontractors are necessarily level three, but there will be kind of an overall lift of expectation um, for data protection. Um, and as a result, I've, I've kind of said previously that level three is probably the appropriate baseline from a, just a general practice perspective for virtually all contractors um, out there. If not from a certification standpoint, just from a practice uh, perspective, trying to get to level three at the very least at some point down the road. And so finally, just kind of talking about the certification process itself, um, now's the time to get ready, um, to get started, to start thinking about certification requirements in, contract if you, in contracts if you plan to bid. Um, there doesn't necessarily need to be a panic right now to become certified just yet due to the contract numbers I mentioned previously, but it's absolutely imperative to begin thinking about what needs to be done. Um, when requirements are defined, you really don't want to, to start that audit, uh, certification audit, and then ultimately fail because you haven't done an honest and, and thorough assessment of, of your environment um, previously. So now's, now's really the time to start thinking about it. Um, DOD has announced that the C3PAO program will likely start next month. We're going to start training assessors. Um, full disclosure, DHG hopes to become um, a C3PAO assessor at, at some point. Um, we're kind of following along what the expectations and requirements are. We've had a lot of experience with NIST 8171. Um, so that's coming down the pike probably in the next month or two in anticipation of, of RFIs that will contain the, um, the certification requirement uh, later this year. But stay tuned. This is, this is all evolving. Uh, very rapidly, their <laughs> sort of information trickled out, um, um, and we'll continue to do so over the coming weeks, but uh, just continue to, to watch the news. Um, I don't have it in a slide here, but monitor the CMMC accreditation body website, and I'll just say the URL right here, CMMC AB, accreditation body, AB.org, CMMC AB.org. Um, and that's where the sort of the primary source for, for a lot of this information is um, is started. And then finally, um, Richard's kind of letting me give a, a plug for our firm's annual event, the, what we call the Government uh, Contracting Update Seminar. We have this every year um, in the May time frame. Uh, it will be held again in, in Tyson's, the Ritz-Carlton Tyson's. Um, it's really a fantastic event. I've, I've had the ability to, to participate the last couple of years with a presentation or two around cyber. Uh, we talk a lot about hot-button topics um, of the day that impact contractors. Um, and because CMMC is such a big initiative this year for DOD, we've actually put together an all-day track um, of content completely dedicated to cybersecurity. Um, cybersecurity compliance, CMMC. We'll have presenters on um, on the framework itself from principal contributors uh, to the, the build of CMMC. Um, the accreditation body will be in attendance, um, as well as a lot of third-party providers that have a lot of experience with um, managing compliance programs. And frankly, by May, you know, we kind of expect the, the landscape to be a lot different and ideally a lot clearer. Um, so we really think we're going to have a lot of stuff to talk about. We want to help contractors get ready to be in compliance. Um, when CMMC starts to be starts to appear in contracts. As I said, now's the time to start thinking about it to get ready. So please do reach out to me um, or head to our URL to, to get more information. But it should be a great event and uh, hope a lot of folks on the call can make it. But um, 
Richard, I think we've got about 10 minutes. I don't know if we there are any questions or if we want to take any, but uh, happy to do so. Share what I can. Sure. Um, I'll get it kicked off by asking a question. Um, for primes, how much flexibility do they have to determine the level of their contractors? Say, for example, a prime wins a level three contract. Do they have the ability to define the boundaries and decide, well, this information might not be level three CY, or is this pretty much going to be tied to the contract? Do you have any sense of that? Um, DOD has been pretty explicit that um, any system or service associated with performance of the contract will have to adhere to the maturity level that is referenced in the contract. Um, sections, I think L and M uh, is where it will sit in a contract. So I don't think there's a whole lot of flexibility, if any at all. But right. again, you know, this is, I'm, I'm not the authority, but that's the perspective that I've got. Okay. Another question for you. Um, Will the assessment procedures include guidance on how to evaluate a third party's process maturity? And is that at the domain of the levels? Is it similar or, you know, um, understanding the practices are more objectively mapped to the 800-171 controls, the process seems to be much more subjective. So I guess the question is, you know, is it going to be clear what process maturity means? Yeah, well, that's a great question. And I alluded to it, I think, earlier. Um, DOD wants to be very transparent with this, and they've said that pretty explicitly. And so the, the guidance for performing an assessment that C3PAOs will, will follow will be publicly available, and we anticipate that in the coming weeks and, and months. So when it comes down to you know, what exactly does a control or process look like or have to look like, what is the maturity behind it, um, anyone will be able to see what that looks like, what that assessment will look like, what the requirements will be. And ideally, contractors can then use that to start to, to evaluate their own subs um, that have to adhere to requirement as well. Yeah, but that answers the question. Yeah, I mean, speaking off the cuff here, I mean, in the a lot in the CMMC is influenced, I think, by the CMMI. And they again have process maturity levels where you move from managed to you know a more organizational approach, and the documented um, level, you know, seems like okay. Do you have all your processes documented? And then the next level is about well, is it resourced? You know, is it reviewed, et cetera, et cetera. So it seems like they they could define those kind of criteria in the process similar to the CMMI the CMMI processes. All right. Uh, if, Anyone yeah. else has any additional questions, please type them in. Um, what, one thing, of course, hanging out there, and again, this may be impossible for you to comment on, Tom, is today DFARS and NIST 800-171 are the law of the land. And to get CMMC as a contract requirement, I guess we'll need to get a rule change, right? Do you have any comment or thought on whether that could be achieved in the you know fairly short timeline? A change to the to the DFARS? Yeah, if because today I guess the contract language is all about DFARS and NIST 800171, and of course that will need to be updated presumably for presumably not retro retroactive, yeah. but, but moving forward. Yeah, K Katie Arrington at DOD has said that that will be updated by September, so they do expect that to to get sort of updated and corrected for the new CMMC expectation. Okay. And uh, another question asked about the slides being available. Yes, we will share a copy of the slides after the event. Um, another question here is, and this is the impossible one because it hasn't been defined yet, but do you have any sense, you alluded to FedRAMP, do you have any sense of the cost of the certification? I don't. I, what I do know is that the accreditation body is actively trying to decide how to frame cost and what cost expectations should be. They even had a poll. You could, I'm not sure if it's still up, but you could go to their website and suggest what you thought um, an assessment would cost. And so they're trying to poll 
auditors, they're polling contractors themselves to just get a sense for what is going to be reasonable. Of course, it does come down to level of effort for, for the auditor and assessor. Um, but I mean, there is there, there hasn't been any explicit guidance, and there there are no boundaries set for for that just yet. Right. That I'm aware of. Yeah, I think I heard a quote from Katie Arrington saying that she felt if a level one costs more than a few thousand dollars, she's failed. And of course, she's not defining the audits. <laughs> and it might be hard to imagine professional yeah. auditors being able to accomplish you know, a robust audit even at level one for that kind of amount of money. So it will be interesting to see what happens. Um, yeah, absolutely. The next question about is the mechanism for hiring C3POs. Um, will the DOD have it, or is it going to be, um, you know, provided to the DIB members, or is it going to be on the AB website? Um, DOD has, has stated that there will be sort of a, I don't know the right term, database or repository of C3PAOs that, that are accredited by the, the AB. Um, it sounds like as of right now that it will be up to the contractor to engage a C3PAO. Um, it's going to kind of be a, similar to, to FedRAMP. You know, you'll find the C3PAO that makes the most sense for for your organization, whether it's cost or you know, service and performance and so forth. Um, but there will be a, a database and ability to go find a collection of C3PAOs. Okay. All right, um, we'll ask one more question. Um, the scope, I think, is an interesting topic. You know, uh, a contract is going to have the level of CMMC compliance specified, but of course, an organization may have multiple sites and even multiple networks. Do you have any thoughts on how a contractor might be able to find the scope of what an assessment should look like? Not at this time. No, I, I alluded to, to that a little bit that, um, you know, it's really unclear whether it's the organization that is certified or whether it is an environment or a particular system um, that would be certified. It could be one or, or, or all of those, frankly, at this point. That's part of the guidance that's expected here pretty, pretty shortly, I think. Um, but nothing, I, I can't say anything definitive at this point. Okay. All right. Well, we do not have any more questions in the queue. Oh, hang on. One more just arrived. Um, is there anticipated to be a database of the DIB members with their certification? Um, DOD has um, stated that there will be a database uh, of that nature it is unclear as to what will be publicly available, however. Um, confidential, confidential information, of course, will not be part of that, but um, it's not real clear if that's going to be something that's just freely accessible from a, from a website. I believe there was a, an RFP or going to be an RFP around a provider to DOD for that service um, fairly recently. There will be something like that, though. All right. Well, as we're almost at our time, um, thank you again, Tom, for your insights. It may well be a topic we want to revisit in a few more months, whereas we have more clarity. But I appreciate everyone's attention on the webinar. I hope you found it useful. We will share the slides and uh, look forward to seeing you at a future webinar. Thank you.